Chamber of Law, the Chief Justice, and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. I'm Carolyn Shapiro, Associate Professor of Law at Chicago Kent College of Law and Director of the Institute on the Supreme Court of the United States, ISCOTUS. I'm here today with one of my colleagues to talk about the, uh, the challenge, constitutional challenges to the individual mandate provision of the Affordable Care Act. Shell, could you introduce yourself? My pleasure, Carolyn. I'm Sheldon Neymar, a professor of law at Chicago Kent College of Law. Uh, before we start talking about the constitutional issues, it might be helpful to talk a little bit about what the statute actually does. The statute is a very complex one. It's over 900 pages, and it's really designed to deal with two problems. The problem, on the one hand, of uninsured persons who are getting medical care, who can't afford to pay for it, and the costs ultimately are borne by all of us who do have insurance. And the second problem is the vast numbers of persons who are uninsured, uh, 50 million by the latest estimate. And the statute deals with that, or purports to deal with that, very comprehensively. How, what, what aspect of the statute is being challenged? Well, there are several aspects. The one of concern for us uh, today is the so-called individual mandate, which requires all persons, uh, with very few exceptions, to purchase health care insurance. And if they don't do so, they are subject to a penalty, which is paid, interestingly enough, uh, on their tax returns to the Internal Revenue Service. And why might such a requirement be unconstitutional? What are the arguments that it is? Well, our government is a government of enumerated powers, which means that Congress cannot enact legislation unless it does so pursuant to a particular provision or provisions of the United States Constitution. And Article One, Section 8 has what's called, among other things, the Commerce Clause. And it gives power uh, to Congress to regulate uh, interstate commerce as well as intrastate commerce in certain circumstances where it affects interstate commerce. And that's the issue in this case. Uh, the so decision I'm just going to stop you for a second. The, the, so Cong Congress can't simply enact any law it wants. It has to be able to tie the law it enacts to one of these provisions in the Constitution? Yes, exactly right. And this, so the Commerce Clause provision uh, allows Congress to regulate, I presume, insurance would be considered interstate insurance commerce. Insurance is very clearly uh, a, an activity uh, that's regulated, that's been regulated by Congress for quite a while, and so is health care. So what is the argument here? The argument here is that this is not your usual Commerce Clause case. This is a case in which the, what's being regulated is not doing something, but failing to do something, failing to buy health care insurance. And the argument is, among other things, that this itself is not an economic uh, activity that's subject to congressional regulation under the commerce power. And the related argument is, if it were, what could Congress under the Commerce Clause not force us to do affirmatively in terms of purchasing things? And this is the argument that the 11th Circuit uh, adopted when it struck down this portion of the Affordable Care Precisely Act. Precisely correct. It was a two-to-one decision. There was a very lengthy dissent. The opinion itself of the majority was 94 pages, and the dissent was 40 or so pages, totaling, well, probably 50, 132 pages. So they had a lot to talk about. Most of the discussion of that opinion did revolve around the uh, individual mandate. And so what are the arguments that the individual mandate is the regulation of commerce? The argument is that the decision not to purchase health care insurance is effectively a, an economic decision. It may be other things as well, personal decisions, health care and the like, but it's also an economic decision and it's part and parcel of an overall, uh, overall health care and health care insurance scheme which affects millions of people across state lines. So the decision not to buy health care insurance in a situation where everybody at some point, with or without health care insurance, is going to need health care, means that people without health care insurance are uh, costing money that the rest of us who health, have health care insurance are paying for. And the argument is that that is just not fair. It's not economically efficient. 
And th this is the kind of affecting interstate commerce you were talking about earlier. Precisely right. We're not talking about what might be called a strictly intrastate or purely local activity. The healthcare insurance industry and healthcare generally are so interrelated and they cross state lines. It's a national kind of a problem, which is what Congress emphasized in its findings for, in the legislative history, that it's not purely local at all. Has the court ever before considered a case involving what might have been described as local activity and found that the Commerce Clause allowed Congress to regulate? It actually has, but nothing like this. There was a, a case in the late, in the early 1940s involving a farmer's uh, decision to grow wheat for uh, home consumption, and the Supreme Court held that Congress, under the Commerce Power, could regulate that. And more recently, in the Raich case coming out of, the medical, of California, the medical marijuana case, the Supreme Court also held that that could be uh, regulated by Congress uh, in order to uh, continue or effectively to regulate the um, interstate shipment uh, and treatment of uh, drugs that were prohibited, part of a complex regulatory scheme. Is, is the Commerce Clause the only clause that might give Congress the power to impose the individual mandate? Well, it turns out that the, uh, the government in this case tried to defend in the 11th Circuit not only based on the Commerce Clause but also uh, the taxing uh, power. Uh, it argued that this was a tax, this so-called penalty was really a tax, and Congress's power under the taxing uh, power, if you will, authority under the taxing power was very broad indeed. Congress could, can regulate uh, almost anything under the taxing power, so the argument goes, so long as it raises revenue. But the 11th Circuit said, well, wait a minute, we're looking at the statute. The act itself repeatedly refers to this as a penalty. And if it's a penalty, it's not designed to raise revenue, which would make it a tax, it's designed to regulate. If it's designed to regulate, it brings us right back to the commerce power. And if it brings us right back to the commerce power, we just held that it's unconstitutional. So no, you can't end run the commerce power by using the taxing power. But this is an important point uh, for, for viewers to understand that even if Congress doesn't have power under any particular provision of the Constitution but one, so long as it has power under that one provision, it can act. And that's what the government was trying to do with the taxing power. Thank you very much, Shell. My pleasure. Thank you.